are the factors for awakening. There's one that the Buddha says is useful everywhere, and that's mindfulness. And of the factors is probably the most misunderstood. You often hear that it means being in the present moment, totally accepting what's going on in the present moment. But then you look at the very beginning instructions and in mindfulness of breathing. And they talk about discerning long breathing and discerning short breathing. Now, if you're totally in the present moment, you wouldn't know what a long breath was. You would have forgotten when the breath started, and you wouldn't be able to compare a long breath with a short breath. Because, in fact, mindfulness means keeping something in mind. And that cuts across the present moment, coming from the past, going to the future. You're picking up messages from the past and transmitting messages to the future. And exactly where those messages get kept is something of a mystery. But it's this process that allows us to see what's going on in the mind. Think about when you're playing a musical instrument and you're trying to keep a steady beat. How do you know that you're keeping a steady beat? It's this combination of mindfulness and alertness. Mindfulness keeps in mind how long it was from one beat to the next. And alertness watches over to make sure that what mindfulness is telling you is actually going on. The fact that we have this ability, this is what enables us to practice. Enables us to get into concentration as we make up our mind that we're going to stay with one object, and then we remember that mem that intention, and then we're alert to make sure that we're actually following through. Alertness is very similar to what in education they call metacognition, M-E-T-A, where the mind is watching the mind. It's the ability to say, when you've read a page, you'll go back and say, well, what did I actually learn from that? You're looking over the activity of the mind. And it's because of that ability to look at the activity of the mind that you can realize, okay, I read something and it just went right past me, you can go back and do it again. You make up your mind, you're going to stay with the meditation, it's the same process. You stay with the breath, stay with the breath. And then you ask yourself, are you really staying with the breath? What's going on? And this ability to know things over time, to keep something in mind, send a message to the future, and then to watch over the mind as it's doing that, that helps in all kinds of levels of the practice. Getting the mind to stay with one thing, and then getting some sense of skill in the practice. The Buddha talks about having your meditation object in hand. And the image he gives is of a person sitting, watching a person who's lying down a person standing watching a person who's sitting. In other words, part of the mind is watching another part of the mind. And it's here you can see what's going on in your meditation, where there's unnecessary stress, what needs to be done. Like if you're realizing that your energy level is low, what do you do? Well, you cast back in your mind to ask yourself, well, one, what have I done in the past that's helped in cases like this? That's one meditation I found that's useful. It's kind of the equivalent to that little message that comes on your phone sometimes says you only have 10% of your battery left, are you ready to go into low energy mode? In other words, to conserve the energy so that you can still use the phone. And the mind has an equivalent 
setting, you might call it, where you just focus on one spot and say, I'm not going to think about anything at all. No evaluation, no nothing, just staying with that one spot as you breathe in, as you breathe out. Let the body do the breathing on its own. You don't have to think about the rate of the breathing. I found it's very useful to focus in the area right around the eyes or in the third eye. Blot out any little motions that would lead to thoughts in that area, because that tends to be an area that the mind uses a lot while it's thinking. And as you get on conservation mode like this, you find that you can build up some energy and then get back to your usual mode of meditation if you have to. That's just one thing you might keep in mind. When your energy is too much and you're thinking all over the place, then you have to remember other techniques that you've used. But the fact that we have this ability to store things away in the mind, even just one, one moment to the next, is a necessary part of learning any skill. The skills of discernment. Sometimes you hear that discernment is about seeing things as they truly are. That's a translation of a Pali term, yataputi yanadasana. But when you look at the Buddha's description of what gets involved in putta, as the part of the ya putta, it's less a knowledge of how things are, more knowledge of how things have come to be. The word putta can either mean true or it means coming into being. And there are a couple of passages that indicate that what's really of interest is seeing how things have come to, into being. It's a process. And the only way you're going to see a process is if you can remember things over time. There's one passage where the Buddha is talking about how you navigate the delicate passage between becoming and non-becoming, because people tend to fall into either one. He says the way out of it is just simply to see things as they've come to be, as they have come to be. In other words, you don't interpret them in terms of becoming. The becoming is a sense of yourself in a world of experience. What the Buddha wants you to see is not what has become, but the process of coming into being. Which means, how does this process develop? And this is indicated in another passage where the Buddha is asking Sariputta to, to interpret a passage, a poem. And Sariputta is quiet. And the Buddha finally says, Have you seen that this has come into being? Buddha Midang Basasi. Yes. And then Sariputta launches into seeing how things have come into being based on nutriment, and then trying to develop a sense of dispassion for the nutriment so that you can develop dispassion for whatever has come into being. So it's a process. You're looking at how things arise through causes. Since you're going to attack the cause, that applies on the one hand to unskillful things that are coming to the mind, things that are causing suffering, but also it applies to learning how to develop the path. We're watching processes here. It's not seeing things as they are, but seeing things how, seeing how things work, seeing how things perform, how they function. So you can direct the function in the right direction. And that requires that you keep things in mind, which is why this understanding of mindfulness is so important. The messages that the past sends to the future, the messages that they're sending to you right now, which messages are worth opening up and listening to? And what messages do you send on? And the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha talks about the duties we have to perform. Those are part of the message that he would recommend. He also recommends frames of reference, the body in and of itself, mind in itself, feelings in and of themselves, dhammas in and of themselves, 
These are the messages that you send on. So on the one hand, you can create a sense of feeling at home here, so you can settle in, be concentrated. And then once there's concentration, then you can look at whatever else comes up as a process to see how you're creating unnecessary suffering out of it, and how you can find the cause. So try to develop this ability to send messages, useful messages, and also to watch over the mind to make sure that it actually is performing in line with what you've learned from the past. This is what alertness does. This is how alertness turns into evaluation. So you get an idea, or it provides the information for evaluation, so you get an idea of what you need to change. where you need to look, what needs to be improved. So your concentration becomes a skill. And then when you get into discernment, again you're evaluating these actions that you're doing. Do they lead to suffering or do they lead away from suffering? If they're leading to suffering, what can you do to stop? Where's the cause? Where's the nutriment? watch things over time. And when you understand mindfulness in the right way, that helps you do that. Because if you're just trying to be totally in the present moment, if, you're, if you were 100% in the present moment, you wouldn't even have language. You wouldn't have any questions. You wouldn't know what you're doing. The fact that the mind can store this data from the present as you go through the present, is what enables you to accomplish things in life, and it's what enables us to accomplish good things in the practice. And that's how it's a factor for awakening, and how it's useful all the time. When you need to read the mind, when the energy level is low, what do you do? Well, there are certain factors for awakening, analysis of dhammas, persistence, racha. These are the ones that you, you would emphasize at that time. When there's too much energy, then you try to go to the calming, concentration, equanimity. But mindfulness is what remembers what the possible problems are, the possible solutions, and then it, together with alertness, checks to make sure that you're actually getting the results that you want. So take careful notice of what messages you're sending to yourself. This is one of the ways in which we use perception on the path. And so the meditation becomes more and more of a skill.